But my name is Sal the CCO. I'm the city councilman from this district here. I want to thank everyone for showing up uh, and thank everyone for taking time out of your day to attend the budget hearing. This is the second one we've got now. And we've got a total of 19 throughout the city of Phoenix. And this is your opportunity. We have a trial budget. It's called a trial budget for a reason, is that, that we put something out there and then we have the public respond to it. And last year, the last several years, as a matter of fact, we've had some significant changes to the budget just from the budget hearings that we've had in the past. And so from uh, my end, of it, I'm gonna turn it over to the city manager, Ed Zerker, and I wanna thank him for coming out today. Uh, from your end, if you haven't filled out one of these cards, and if you want to leave a comment, that's great. If you want to do it publicly, that's great. Or if not, you want to just write it out, we can do that as well. Uh, we take these cards, we take out all the information, and then all the council members get the request that you've made. So if you want to make a change to the budget, we get a copy of every individual that has come out and spoken uh, and had a chance to give their input at each of our budget hearings. And then we assimilate all this, and then every council member gets a copy of it. Uh, from our end, just because you're here at the City District 6 uh, hearing, that doesn't mean that we're not going to see the ones that are up throughout. So every council member gets an opportunity to see your comments. Uh, and then I'm going to turn it over to the City Manager right now, Ed Zerker. Thank you for coming out, Ed. Thank you, Sal. Good morning and welcome. Uh, appreciate Sal hosting it. He's hosting the first two. There, so there will be 20 budget hearings, and today's our first day. And we started right out of the shoot with District 6. So you guys get the first word in on our budget hearing. So thank you for that. I'll first in, uh, introduce our interpreter, our Spanish language interpreter, Gloria. If anyone needs some Spanish language interpretation, and Espanol. Thank you. So this is a, a budget hearing. We're going to do a few things here, so just some housekeeping. If you'd like to speak, we'd ask you to fill out a speaker card. As the councilman said, we've got those to keep track. We are taking minutes. We are recording this for Phoenix TV, Channel 11, so that it's available 24-7 to other people to see. Uh, as Sal said, it also allows other council members to see what is important in other districts of the city. Uh, we will. Uh, Go through some information so hopefully you had a chance to pick up one of these little booklets this has uh, information in more detail about what's being proposed we have a video about an eight minute video that will go at a higher level overview and then if you're really detail oriented and you want to get into it on our website at phoenix.gov budget you can dive into a lot more detail as you are interested in that um, we are going to uh, start with the budget video, then we'll go to the speaker cards. We generally ask people to stay about a three minute time frame. Uh, Sal's very generous with people and, and gives them time to speak uh, uh, longer if they need it, but it helps us keep the meeting moving along so that people can have their opportunity to speak and we can get you out before lunch. So with that, we're going to go to the video and then we will take public comment about this year's 2019-20 trial budget. Thank you for being here. Welcome to your first look at the City of Phoenix trial budget for 2019-20, proposed by the City Manager for public review and comment. The City budget is about people and programs for a stronger Phoenix. Every year, the City prepares a trial budget. This process gives you, our residents, an opportunity to share your priorities and feedback on how tax dollars are spent. Three important points about this year's budget. It is balanced, which is required by law, and there is a surplus to allocate toward people and programs. Also, for the first time since the recession, ongoing revenues are equal to ongoing costs. We have a nearly $1.4 billion structurally balanced general fund budget thanks to Phoenix's continued strong economy and sound leadership by the mayor and city council. 
These efforts have led to a projected surplus of $55 million, of which $35 million is in ongoing resources and $20 million is in one-time resources. Over the next several minutes, we'll provide you a high-level view of the recommendations for how that surplus could be spent. Approximately 70% of the surplus is proposed for employee compensation, and the remaining 30% is proposed for services. And $5.5 million to continue investing in the Public Safety Pension Reserve Trust Fund to protect against unexpected downturns in investments. The 2019-20 trial budget continues to provide the core services residents expect. Chief among these is public safety. In addition, many recommendations are focused on improving neighborhoods, parks, libraries, support for outreach and services for people experiencing homelessness, additional street landscape maintenance, and preparations for the 2020 census. The city also continues to invest in maintaining the facilities you depend on and the fleet of vehicles that provide you everything from police response to street cleanups. Besides these proposals, we'll highlight expenditures that help the city address growth in construction and maintain the city's wastewater infrastructure. First, general fund recommendations. The general fund is made up of several different sources of revenue, including sales taxes, state shared revenue, and property taxes. Three-fourths of the general fund pays for police, fire, and courts, with a smaller portion, the remaining 25%, going for everything else, like libraries, parks, senior services, arts, and administrative and support functions. The primary focus of the general fund service additions is public safety across a wide array of departments. Here are some of the proposals. Eight new firefighter positions to provide 24-hour operations at Fire Station 55 at I-17 and Joe Max Road in North Phoenix. The creation of one new fire department crisis intervention unit and in the police department de-escalation training and community response services support for officer-involved shootings. These recommendations are based on public feedback from last year's budget process and the city's Traumatic Incident Intervention Resources Ad Hoc Committee. Another key area of public safety funding is focused on improving police support processes, using civilian staff to free up police officers' valuable time for calls and service. First, the addition of 10 civilian positions to support a federally mandated transition to the FBI's Uniform Crime Reporting National Incident-Based Reporting System and second, the addition of 13 positions to streamline police booking procedures and create two new centralized booking centers to get officers back on the street faster. The trial budget also provides funding for increased inspection capacity to ensure buildings are meeting fire safety codes. Other public safety allocations public defender representation for veterans and individuals with mental illness in human services, add a caseworker and a vehicle to provide mobile victim advocacy, security guard staffing at every library, technology funding for cybersecurity to protect the city's infrastructure. In all, the trial budget proposes spending an additional $6.5 million on these and other public safety additions. Now, let's look at where you live, investments in programs to strengthen neighborhoods. First, the budget would allocate approximately $1 million to add staff to work with neighborhood groups, to clean up blight, work with nearby businesses, and improve response times for neighborhood issues. Parks and Recreation would see eight new park ranger positions to increase patrol coverage at neighborhood and urban parks for a cost of about $1.1 million. Street transportation and public works would support neighborhoods by transitioning staff from a temporary to permanent status to clean up encampments and washes and right-of-way for a cost of $970,000. Historic preservation would also get $75,000 to support historic property preservation. 
In all, neighborhood revitalization would see an additional $3.5 million in funding. Next, community services additions restore some desired programs to strengthen the community and expand other resident requests, including restoration of Sunday library hours at four branches means all libraries will be open to provide greater access to in-demand books, movies, classes, and programs for library patrons of all ages. Expand the Phoenix Teens program for youth at 10 city sites, providing youth programs six days per week at a cost of $448,000. Providing case management assistance for homeless seniors and grant funding for arts organizations for youth and underserved communities would also be included. The budget would also add $1.3 million for long-standing street landscape maintenance needs, increasing frequency of maintenance from three to four times per year. New this year, a proposal to allocate funding to implement participatory budgeting or other projects in city council districts. Lastly, the city will invest in outreach to encourage residents to take part in the 2020 census. Given the move to digital form submission this census, the additional funds will help to ensure hard to count and hard to reach populations participate so that Phoenix gets its fair share of the approximately $866 million in annual revenues allocated through federal programs for public safety, transportation, housing, and human services. Overall, added general fund expenditures outlined in the trial budget total $55.2 million and would add 131 positions to strengthen our people, programs, services, and infrastructure. Moving on to propose non-general fund additions for a variety of services. Strengthening our street transportation department with 11 positions added or converted to full time for a variety of services to support increasing work in the right of way and the recently expanded street maintenance funding in the capital improvement program budget, $768,000. Water services will see 21 positions and approximately $2.9 million in funding to keep up with demand at the department's 91st Avenue treatment site, the state's largest. The site is currently treating 180 million gallons of water a day for more than 2.5 million residents in five cities. Finally, 19 positions for planning and development to address increasing construction demand, including reduction of turnaround times for pre-application submittals and complex commercial architectural plans. Added staff to ensure adherence to fire system requirements and ADA accessibility codes, and to maintain a 24-hour turnaround time for residential inspections. Thank you for taking the time to learn more about the 2019-20 trial budget. We hope that you'll review additional details in the budget pamphlet available at one of our 19 community budget hearings and online at phoenix.gov slash budget. Please share your feedback in whatever way works best for you at a public meeting or via email at budget.research at phoenix.gov. You can comment on the city's social media at City of Phoenix AZ on Facebook or Twitter and use hashtag Phoenix Budget or call us at 602-262-4800. Thank you for being part of this important process. All right, thank you. Uh, I want to recognize we have a lot of city staff here who are here to listen. And if you have very specific things, they will be able to uh, help you with that. But it's important for our city staff to hear what's going on with uh, members of the community and, and things that are of interest. So I uh, want to thank our city staff for being here. And with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Councilman DeCicio to start the comments. Thank you, Ed. And uh, we're going to start off with Donna Reiner. Good morning, Donna. So good morning, Mr. DeCicio, Mr. Zucker staff and fellow citizens i know this is weird but this is one of the favorite times of the year for me ha. so i am fully support of what you have in the trial budget i just want you to know that but as the vice president of the friends of phoenix public art there is one to me glaring oversight 
Um, Phoenix has one of the best public art programs in the nation, thanks to our willingness to commit to the 1% uh, capital projects to public art and to the innovative spirit in the incorporating art into the design of much of our infrastructure. So public art, like any capital project, needs to be maintained. And I notice that there's a lot of money going to infrastructure maintenance. Um, because if we don't maintain the public art, this investment in our community could be wasted. And we all would rather not remember what happened to the lack of response of taking care of our investment in Burton Bar Library. So I want to say thank you for all the years that the city has included in its budget increases in the maintenance budget for public art. And the Friends of Public Art have also raised funds privately to support this endeavor. But we can't do all of it. So in addition to the other priorities supported by the Public Arts and Culture Commission in this year of a budget surplus, the shitty city, sorry, Oops. the city should continue to build on this maintenance budget by increasing the public art maintenance budget. And I believe by a minimum, I'm not being greedy, by a minimum of $25,000. It will go a long way to helping improve our reputation that we have of this superb public art. And since so much of it is infrastructure involved, I know it's the pay me now or pay me a whole lot more later. Remember that? Thank you. Thank you. There we've got Craig Tripkin. Good morning, Mr. City Manager and Councilman DeCicio. Thank you very much for doing this. Let me fix what I've done here. Uh, well, I'll... I'm sorry. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. City Manager and, and Councilman. Uh, I appreciate the time limit. I've worked hard on trying to keep this in the time frame on which I'm wasting right now. But as you know, uh, sort of like Fidel Castro, I can go on and on if you let me. Uh, I want to tell you about, uh, I, want to, I want to make four points to you. Number one, I'm here representing Central Arizona Shelter Services, um, which receives general fund money, actually it doesn't receive general fund money, it receives federalized money, uh, which is through the Emergency Solutions Grant Fund. Number one, we're doing our part. We have evolved and made a lot of changes this year. I'll come back to this stuff. Uh, we have increased uncontrollable financial burdens that we simply cannot control, and, and they're very real. Number three, we've got plan for increased effectiveness for next year. And number four, I'm going to make an ask. Uh, number one, we have doing our part. We've increased private fundraising by 78% this year. That's a total of $500,000, which is more than half of what we get from the city of Phoenix. So we have, we have done that. We continue to expect that arc to go up significantly. Number two, we have increased support from regional cities. And that's very important, I know, to this city council. This is a regional problem. We have a 53% increase in regional support, in support from other cities. Uh, our accomplishments this year, uh, we've got a, a grant for two senior navigators uh, for a third of our population is seniors. Uh, we have acquired a building in Glendale to provide some regional services out there. Uh, we uh, got a grant for a West Valley housing navigator. Uh, we've served 4,000 individuals and I will race through this. Um, our child care program received a five star first things first rating uh, and we serve veterans and I'll, I won't beat you to death with numbers. Increased financial burdens, which I think is very important. We are looking at funding cuts from United Way, a third of our funding, or excuse me, a third of their funding to us. We're just looking at a cut of at least $236,000 from United Way this year. General salaries and benefits, which we can't control, and the city's funding some of those things, not out of us, but in, within yourselves. Uh, $110,000 increased uh, human services campus facility charge. We are 
We have not been paying much rent to the Human Services Campus. They are saying that we are in the neighborhood of a $100,000 expense to them, so we certainly expect a rent increase. It comes out to $546,000 that we cannot control. There are simply going to be more costs next year, which is about what our fundraising was increased for this year. Increasing program effectiveness for next year. With the additional flexible dollars, and I want to underline the word flexible, um, we are going to expand senior housing programs for seniors on Social Security. We're going to open the, what we call the Ramsey Norton Glendale Success Center. Uh, we're going to add uh, 10 beds providing medical services for seniors and chronically ill people so that we can have a section for people who, who, who need regular chronic medical, medical care, but, but we don't, are not able to provide within our current structure. Uh, we are going to, uh, am I out of time already? Dang. We're going to pilot a hospital patient release program, handoff program, and uh, we're going to collate, locate behavioral health services. I'll just leave it at that. What we are doing is aggressive things. None of those things can be funded within our current fee-for-service contract with the city. So we need more flexible funding from the city of Phoenix because right now we provide a service and we get paid dollars for that service. We will privately, we're asking you for $258,000, okay? That's half of our deficit. We will raise the other half ourselves. And then uh, I'm asking for, again, partial relief from the fee-for-service model for more flexible and nimble funding. Because, because of, of the seven things I told you we're gonna do next year and of the four things I told you we do this year, those are not fundable by, within the context of the City of Phoenix contract, within the context of the money we get from the City of Phoenix. And I will stop there. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Craig. Uh, former city council member, Craig Christie. Uh, Gloria Gonzalez. Good morning. Uh, I don't know if you can hear me. How's that? Better? Oh. Uh, my name is Gloria Gonzalez, and I live in the represented Garfield organization in the neighborhood. In 2008, the city commissioned a pro preliminary roadway and drainage analysis of 13th Street between Moreland and Van Buren to develop alternatives for installation of curbs, gutter, asphalt, and to improve drainage conditions. 11 years later, there is still no curb and glutter and gutter. So every time there is rain, water pools during monsoon, residents frequently deal with flooding at, as work, water covers sidewalks and enters their yards and homes. When it is dry the, and residents seek to park alongside the road, there are often clouds of dust. This leads to residents who are parking next to their own homes to be ticketed by police for having non-dusted proofed surfaces. This catch-22 situation is eternally unfair and would not be tolerated in most communities. 13th Street also serves our Garfield Elementary, which means kids are walking through water or clouds of dust on a regular basis. Garfield has been a neighborhood initiative area since 1990s. We've been requesting for help for decades and nothing has happened. We kindly request that funds be allocated so that the city not only paves 13th Street, but actually add curb gutters to our neighbors so they can stop blooding and dust. Uh, I think that it's important that we are an older, older neighborhood, but that you're not, we're not forgotten. And the children need it. You know, the, the school is right there and they breathe all this, which is not good for their health. And for me as a senior, I breathe it also, which is also not good for my health. But we would ask you to please, please don't put us off more years than we've been put off. Please consider us. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, and Mrs. Gonzalez, that's yes. in District 8. Um, I've already made a commitment to Councilwoman Mendoza to help her with this as well. Um, and I 
appreciate the fact that you're going to each of the budget hearings. I think it's important that you do that, uh, only because it's good that others get to hear what the problems are and you forget about the mold that you have in your area as well because of the flooding. Thank you very you much, sir. There, you bet. Thank you. Jody Moman. Good morning. I'm Jody Moman, and I live at 6211 East Choya Lane. Uh, we have 57 homeowners on our street, which is a dead end street. And the Choya Trail for Camelback Mountain is on that same street, and almost 600,000 people annually hike that trail. There are hikers, bikers, scooters, pedestrians, hotel vans, Uber and Lyft drivers, as well as regular drivers dropping off or picking up hikers. It's a circus on a weekend. People even use any available bush to relieve themselves for the rest of us to see. Well, Parks Department does not have the staff or resources to handle this volume of, of hikers on a residential street. We are lucky to have rangers there a few days a week, but as soon as they leave, all the vehicles do whatever they want. The hikers go anywhere they want. I'm asking that you put this uh, relocation of Choya Trail into the budget for this year. This is a matter of public safety. This is a critical accident waiting to happen. Sometimes there are hundreds of people on the street at any given time, and people walk 10 people deep in the street where you have a mix of cars, vans, emergency vehicles trying to use the road at the same time. In October 2017, the Phoenician PUD was approved by City Council with a stipulation. I have the um, ordinance number on that too, and I can hand it to you if you need it. But at a minimum, it said a minimum 10, uh, 15 foot wide easement shall be dedicated for a public natural hiking foot only trail at a mutually agreed upon location between the property owner and the Parks and Recreation Department within the 100 foot open space area. This easement starts roughly around Staghorn and Invergordon. So rather than coming up Choya Lane, they would enter and have a quicker access to the Choya Trail. Well, Phoenix Park Department hired Dick Studio to complete a feasibility study. And in 2018, there were four options in which the new trail could be built. So, and I believe those numbers came in even less than what they had predicted that they were going to be. So the Venetian has stated that they are uh, about two years away from beginning construction on the residential lots. The trail could easily be completed prior to this construction. And should we have to wait until after their construction is completed, we will have the same situation in our neighborhood for another five to 10 years before it gets moved. And this is just not acceptable. When the Phoenician was renovating their golf course, they mentioned that they would use the Staghorn entrance for their construction. However, the only thing they used at that location was for the water storage tank. I implore you to get this in the budget so that we can live in a normal neighborhood Hikers have a quicker access to the trail and everyone will be safer. We're talking about a 15 foot trail in that 100 foot easement. So it's not that much to somehow figure this out. And since we're talking about the budget, if this relocation of the trail will not happen next year, then at a minimum, budget for the police and rangers to be stationed sunrise to sunset like they do at Echo Canyon. Um, and I invite any of you to come to our house on a weekend and see, um, I can provide coffee, donuts, mimosas, beer, <laughs> whatever you can do to see how much of a disaster this is. And it is a huge public safety. I'm surprised somebody hasn't been hit yet by a car. But anyway, thank you for considering that. Thank you very much, Jody. And I think we spoke earlier, for those of you that are also here for the Troy Trail, I'm in the process of getting a meeting set up with the attorney representing the Phoenician, Paula Gilbert. And uh, Rusty Lyons has also agreed to make a phone call to try and get that thing expedited. He knows Paul pretty well as well. And I've already had a preliminary conversation with him. We're going to have a more detailed conversation with him and find out what the main issues that he has regarding his concern over the liability issues. And you're right, 15 feet out of 100 is only leaves 85 feet around there. but. Again, we still got to figure out where the traffic's going to be going to do the construction, but I think it can be worked around there. Sure. Yeah. You bet. Thanks, Joe. Dr. Hawkins.
Good morning. Uh, good morning, good Mr. Morning. Zucker, and thank you for being here, Councilman DeCicio, who has been really wonderful in trying to help us. Um, I support uh, what Jody said about getting the trail moved sooner than later. It doesn't make any sense to me to have the Phoenicians starting to build homes at the same time that the trail is being built. It would be so much easier, faster, and probably less expensive to get that trail put in on that easement prior to development of the land. At least that's how I see it. Um, the traffic, uh, we have a lot of problems, and Jody touched on a lot of it, but the traffic in general on Invergordon is so much worse than it was a couple of years ago when they did the traffic feasibility study. They said that there, there wouldn't be any increased traffic because of the trail. I, I'm very concerned about that. Right now it's very, very hard to make a left turn out of Invergordon. Um, also, cars will double park um, on Invergordon waiting for a parking spot and they block the bike, half of the bike lane and, and half of the street. So we have to cross the solid yellow line if you just want to get to where it is you're going. Uh, so traffic is a real issue. Um, also, uh, when parks are there, and we love our park employees, they, they have been just great. Uh, when they're there, people always just turn in. They don't read the sign, they don't care. So they turn in, the parks people have to stop them, and they turn around in our driveway. Um, when the parks people aren't there, they drive up the street, and then they turn around, and there's really no good turnaround place at the top of the street. Um, and so they're backing in and out of people's driveways. Um, and then the drop-offs are ridiculous. They bring vans and buses from the resorts, and despite efforts to try to stop that, uh, they're ignored and they'll stop again right in the intersection so if you're trying to get out of Invergordon you're blocked uh, it's it's pretty annoying uh, foot traffic in the road is a big problem I, I think you can get about three people abreast on the trail um, but people will walk five ten people I and mean, it's just clumps of people when they get off the bus they block up half the street um, the other problem is that people cross the street uh, if people are driving north to south and turning onto Invergordon, it's a blind turn. And people will be crossing the street, and I can't tell you how close I've gotten to hitting somebody because you can't see them. There's no crosswalk, designated crosswalk at that intersection. The other big concern of mine is that we, I was there, I moved in in 1996, and John Theobald had an agreement with Parks and City and, and all the cities that there would only be 33 parking spots. We have about 100 people parking on Invergordon. Um, and they said, and when we brought it up before at the council meeting, they said, well, that agreement isn't in force anymore or active anymore, whatever the word was. That's nonsense. There was no, there was no expiration date on that agreement with the homeowners. So we feel quite betrayed uh, with that. Um, litter, bottles, wrappers. I walk up the street regularly, and I always pick up litter. It's very annoying. Dog poop is the other big problem. Um, people uh, take their dogs. I saw a dog owner defy the park employee and take the dog up anyway. Um, human waste is another big issue. A, a fellow was urinating in our drainage easement. I should have taken a picture, but didn't think of it fast enough. Um, and um, trespassing on our property. People use our walls as seats. And then the last thing are, now it's the dockless scooters. It used to be green bikes, uh, line bikes, but now it's dockless scooters that are littering the sidewalks. So thank you for listening. And I think the biggest concern that you have also, probably the largest one that we have here, deals with the security and the safety of individuals. When you're talking tens of thousands of people that are using a trailhead, mixing that with traffic, it just doesn't go well. I mean, people in cars don't, aren't very compatible as long as they're in, if they're in the car they're compatible if they're not it becomes yeah. a real problem and when our gate wasn't working people the hikers just came in and walked through our neighborhood mm -hmm. and that was pretty annoying and one of the things i think we're looking at it's on the table because some mem members have also mentioned this as well the city manager is here it's once we come up with the solution possibly even look at gating out that street at some point in the future if the if the neighbors are still wanting to do that I think that will be a hard sell for many of the neighbors because Agreed. that means we would have to pay for a lot of services that mm -hmm. we're already paying taxes mm -hmm. for. So I, I don't I'm think that will happen. letting you know that that's still on the table. Okay. Others have mentioned it to me that they still may want to look for a longer term solution. I'm just just putting it on the yeah, table. No. Yeah. Thank you. You bet. Thank you, Dr. Hawkins. Lori Munn. Good 
morning, everyone. Good morning, Councilman, again. Yeah. Good morning, Mr. City Manager. Thank you for uh, allowing us to speak today at this hearing. I am here representing the Friends of the Phoenix Public Libraries, and I wanted to advocate for the opening of every library branch every day. I did a little research between the early morning budget hearing that was at 8 o'clock and this one and learned that the only city in the top 10 cities in the country that has every library branch in its town open every day is San Antonio, Texas. We can't do better than San Antonio, Texas? Come on. We have 326 hours every week that we are leaving on the table in the fifth largest city in the country. That extrapolates to almost 17,000 library hours a year. And the Friends funds programs for City of Phoenix residents of all ages, from early childhood literacy all the way to classes for seniors. We also um, provide funding for a college depot, which helps young people get ready to go to college in the terms of prep for SAT testing and how to write your essay and STEM training, all types of programs for, for the city and for people who live here. And I myself am actually a product of the Palo Verde Library in Maryville. My current library is Ironwood, that's my neighborhood branch, and my adopted branch is Burton Bar. And the good that is done by such a robust library system here in the city of Phoenix, we are fortunate. And the fact that we're leaving 17,000 hours on the table in terms of programming time is, is really unacceptable in the fifth largest city in the country. So my hope is that we will fund every library every day and not just the four hours on Sundays for the branches that are not closed. We have two branches. Out of the 17 branches that we have, only two of them are open every day of the week. I think we can do better. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lori. Uh, Sandra Lines, regarding Choi. Thank you both for allowing me to speak here today. Uh, I'm also a neighbor of Choi Lane. I just wanted to uh, support my neighbors. I agree with everything that they said. I would like to add that when we bought our home in 1990, there was no trail. We went to a city meeting where we begged the people there in the administration not to open the trail. We're a residential neighborhood. Uh, we anticipated problems, but we did anticipate how huge the problems are. We, I'd just like to add, too, that we had the fire department on our street at least three or four times a month, tried to help some hiker who fell or didn't have water or wasn't prepared for the hike. That blocks our street. We're at a corner when we have to turn, we're right at the trail and we can't get through, um, it's been a nightmare. I would appreciate money being put in the budget now so that we can get the trail off our street. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Lyons. And just for those of you that are here that don't understand or see the magnitude of what's occurring in this neighborhood, you have literally tens of, I mean, this is probably the most popular trailhead that we have in the city of Phoenix. And you can just imagine tens of thousands of people walking on a street, coming up a, tr uh, up, you know, basically up a street where they all live, and people trying to get in and out. And even if it just takes just the slightest distraction from one person, one driver that's not familiar with the area, the neighbors have all been fantastic. They are aware of the problem. But imagine someone coming in from out of state, not familiar, driving on that road. And then you have hikers, which I'm a hiker. I, you know, I admit that. I'm, I love our trails. I love our mountain preserves. I love all of that. Uh, it's, we're very unique in the country because we have such great preserves. But those great preserves also bring in a lot of people from all over. So imagine your neighborhood with tens of thousands of people on a street mixing with cars. It just doesn't go well. And we're lucky that nothing's happened so far. So thank you for being here. Uh, Adriana Baum? Okay, sure. Oh, sure. Yeah. Oh, you did one too? Okay. You too. How are you? Good, thank you. 
Hi, thank you uh, for taking the time to, to hear us out. Uh, my name is uh, Scott Grigg, and is it coming through? Yep. Uh, name is Scott Grigg, and we are actually one of the latest residents to Choya Lane. We moved in about eight months ago into a development called uh, the Ch uh, Choya Heights, which is just right up past the trail. And I think if we knew the degree of what was going on, we probably wouldn't have moved in. I mean, it's it's been a nightmare uh, from the start. So what our days consist of is, is dodging people when leaving the house. Uh, as the other neighbors said, typically we have people doing cart cartwheels down the middle of the street, not looking where they're going. And now they're walking on both sides, so it only leaves the middle lane to drive down. Um, also, you know, now the Parks Department does have signs out at the bottom of Choi and Invergordon that say no drop-offs. However, those drop-offs take place every, every minute. And uh, they just look at the sign and they drop off. And when you're trying to turn out on Invergordon, you can't see, there's blind spots. I think we've almost been hit twice. Um, there's a couple times where my folks won't even come visit us when, uh, when the trailhead's busy because they're afraid to come up our street that they're gonna hit someone. So there's a very likely chance something's gonna happen very soon where someone's gonna get hit and killed or there's gonna be a major accident there. Also in our development, we're doing new construction. We have people that go around our gate constantly. We have porta potties up there that are for our construction workers that the, uh, the hikers are actually constantly using. We have to chase them off the property, which becomes very combative, usually doesn't end well. Um, so there's issues there uh, with the trespassing aspect. Uh, about once a week, I see someone urinating in someone's yard as we're leaving. Uh, that happens quite often too as well. And then the nighttime hiking. They're specifically not supposed to hike at night, but every single night we see headlamp lights up there. So why isn't someone there ticketing them or stopping them from going up to the trail? You know, if it's gonna be a while before the trailhead gets moved, we really would like to see some sort of police presence up there. Maybe we can get together with the residents and everyone divvy in a fund similar like they do over at Biltmore Estates where they have City of Phoenix drive through on an hourly basis or someone there to hold them responsible for what they're doing. We can barely get inside and out of our gate. Um, it's always uh, traffic there because like the residents said, they come up and it's our turnaround they use. So it's always crowded and impossible to get in and out. People do drop offs off the Choya as well. And then another thing is, and I don't know how we can come to an agreement on this, they brought up about the fire department. When fire department does a rescue, they use our community as parking for their trucks. When they come in, they unlock our gates. They sit open for a period of a half hour and 45 minutes. During that time, we might have 20 trailhead people come through. A lot of times they'll park in there. Then we have to have them towed or chase them off. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd like to see if the fire department does come in to use our area that someone's there from the fire department to restrict anyone walking through our gated community while they have those gates open, or else use another area for the storage of their vehicles when they do rescues, instead of coming through our community to do that. That's been a big problem for us. Also, we have uh, pavers at the bottom of our community which are getting torn up daily from those fire trucks coming up through that community. So if we can work towards an agreement or something along those lines to kind of find a happy medium. So, thank you. Thanks for being here, Scott. Sure. Yeah. For, uh, Frank Marino. Frank? Frank is one of our police officers, and we want to thank you for everything you do, Frank. And for those police officers that are here today, we appreciate everything you do to protect us. I uh, you know it's been very difficult for a lot of you, uh, especially since we've been short on officers in the city of Phoenix and for the work that you do to protect us. Uh, and I know you get criticized so much, you don't ever get the thanks that you deserve. And the thanks you deserve is a lot more significant because of the things that you do for us. Thank you. Thank you, Sal. Thank you, Ed. Can everybody hear me okay? All right, I tend to get nervous when I speak in front of large groups like this. Uh, as Sal said, my name is Franklin Marino, and I actually, I'm here today speaking with wearing three hats. First and foremost, I'm a resident of the city. 29 years I've lived in Arizona. I've lived in Phoenix for about 25 of those years on and off, starting in 1989. I am a police officer. I've been with the department. This is my 25th year. I also serve as the secretary of the Phoenix Law Enforcement Association. That's the police union. We represent approximately 2,500 
of your rank and file Phoenix police officers and detectives. Those are your first responders that are out there answering calls for service. Those are, your de those are the detectives that do the follow-up on the caseload once an initial investigation is conducted. So we're here to talk about the budget, and I've been doing this for about seven years now. So to help the city out after to avoid catastrophic cuts to services after the Great Recession, the city essentially stopped hiring public safety employees. That's police and fire. Just as importantly, we agreed to take paid cuts and furloughs beginning in 2010 to help out with that budget. So between 2010 and 2012, we took a 1% wage cut plus 16 furlough hours. 1% pay cut was undone in 2012. Additional concessions took place in 2014. Uniform allowance was reduced by $650. 12 unpaid holidays in 2014, 32 unpaid holidays in 2016. Our concessions were not fully restored until last July, July 2018, eight years later. So essentially, we've taken a 17.5% pay cut over the past 10 years. Now, restoring concessions does nothing to address the rising cost of living in Phoenix. So right now, our earnings were about 17.5% less than what we did in 2010 because of the impact of inflation. Top step officer, we're still making the same what we were in 2010. 2010 starting pay for a new officer was $24.50 an hour. Now it's $24.75 an hour. So additionally, I know we hear about pension debt and how that's a big deal. Well, police and public safety, fire, we work together for pension reform. There was a proposition that was passed to address the growing pension costs. We worked together. We knocked on doors to support a ballot measure. So for 10 years, we've done more with less. The workload and stress level for public safety has spiked in the last 10 years. So has the population. We hear how we're the fifth largest and fastest growing city in the country. Right now, I think we're sitting at about 1.6 million residents, give or take, and that changes on a daily basis. Today, the police department, we have roughly, and I'm talking rough numbers because it constantly changes, about 500 fewer officers than what we had in 2008. Right now, we're sitting at about 2,900 total. That's from the chief down to the newest officer on the street. That's actually about 228 less than the city manager's goal of 3,125, which we were supposed to achieve last July. So real quick, I'll wrap it up. I know my time's up, but uh, over 80 officers have to retire this year. That includes assistant chiefs, commanders, lieutenants, sergeants, and rank and file. There's about 600 of us that can walk away now because we have our time in to retire. So what we're asking is, is that the city provide money to not only pay for us, but also to recruit qualified personnel to become our police officers. Tough to become a Phoenix cop when you can go work for Buckeye or Goodyear, making more money with less risk and less workload. Thank you. And thank you, Frank, and thank you to all the other officers that do so much for us. Luke Black. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Luke. I um, actually, you're not my council member, but you're the one that this meeting is the one that is closest to my house. Um, I am here to ask that the city uh, increase its investment in the people of this city. Um, there is uh, roughly $1.3 billion in the general fund. Um, for those of you that don't know, the general fund is what funds our police. $548 million of that general fund will go to our police. Everything that you have asked for so far cannot be funded as long as we continue to pour money into the police department. Uh, I am asking that the city focus general fund spending on more affordable housing, more services for homeless folks and victims of domestic violence, free programs for youth, and mental health support. We want to have a strong Phoenix. We want to have a Phoenix that people love to live in. People don't move to a city because of the police department. People move to a city because the parks are great, because there's great public transportation, because we take care of our residents. We need to continue to fund programs and we need to increase funding to those programs. As an example, I offer um, three different things that are being that money is being allocated for in 
the budget in the general fund budget that could go towards building a stronger, safer city uh, for our people. First of all, there's $370,000 in the transportation fund that is meant to move homeless folks off the street. Uh, CAS has already been here. They've asked for $258,000. That money could easily go to support CAS, support the amazing work that they do, and help folks that are dealing with homelessness here in our city. Second, in the general fund, there is an allocation of $336,000 for library security. This money is set aside for, for more security uh, because we've had individuals who are dealing with uh, homelessness are using libraries more. Uh, that money could be set aside for increasing hours for our libraries, investing in programs at those libraries, and it could also be set aside for training for library staff on how to help folks that are dealing with homelessness. Second, there, or third, there's or $1.07 million set aside in this budget for park rangers. Okay? We don't need more park rangers. We need better parks. We need better trails. Uh, we need access to good park equipment. We need open park equipment. We need drinking fountains at our park. Putting park rangers and criminalizing folks that use our park doesn't actually make our parks better. And then lastly, there is um, an additional $2.5 million in the general fund that has been set aside for the police department. Uh, we are asking for a freeze on that funding until the city invests its money in the people that work and that live here, whether that's our parks or our libraries, uh, whether that's our streets, uh, whether it's water issues on Garfield and 13th Street. The city has a lot more places that it can spend that $2.5 million than in our police department. Thank you. Thank you for coming out today. Uh, Karen Cruz. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Councilman, and good morning, our City Manager, Ed Zucker. I've, I've known them both for a very long time, and I can tell you um, that we are in very good hands with uh, the diverse leadership on the Council and with Ed Zucker as our manager, so I, that's a very good place to start. Uh, I am a resident of District 6, and I'm here on behalf of the Friends of the Phoenix Library. I'm a proud board member of the Friends of the Phoenix Library. We have more than 13,000 supporters of the Friends of the Phoenix Library, and I'm also here on behalf of the more than 1 million library card holders here today. Um, and I want to just say thank you so much for continuing to extend and expand um, support for the libraries. Uh, in this particular budget, there is funds to expand um, to Sunday hours in four different branches, which we certainly appreciate, um, but it does not get us to the pre-recession levels. And I know there's been several people who have spoken very eloquently in support of the library system. Um, so we, we want to definitely get to every library every day. Uh, and I, I'm sporting this very fetching button, and if you would like one of your very own, um, our executive director is here today, and I believe he's got some on hand. Um, we, support, we do support the Friends of the Phoenix Library, as was mentioned, does support, um, we raise nearly a half a million dollars every year for programs um, for our library patrons. Um, there are reading programs, enrichment programs, the Kids Cafe programs, and so to offer those community services and those enrichment programs, um, we need those libraries open um, all day, every day. Um, and so again, thank you so much for your support. Um, and uh, we look forward to chatting again, I am sure. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Karen, and thanks for all your volunteer work. Uh, Abraham James. Abraham, I think I saw you come in. There you are. Thank you very much. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Um, well, I happen to be the uh, chair of the Library Advisory Board, so full disclosure to you there. Um, I'm also the chair of the Greater Green Gables Neighborhood Association. Um, I want to take this opportunity to thank the City of Phoenix for all the positive support it has done for our citizens through good and bad economic times. The mayor, vice mayor, city council members, city manager's office, 
department leaders and staff have been helpful in addressing issues as our city evolves. Um, thank you for your support for the Office of Arts and Culture, the library, the historic preservation office, um, neighborhoods, parks, youth, and senior centers, streets and transportation, police, and fire protection. I applaud you for what you do for our city. As our city continues to grow and evolve, I would hope that with the additional funds within the city budget would go toward increasing library hours, aiding the homeless, uh, substance abuse um, addiction programs, providing additional affordable housing within our downtown and, uh, and central Phoenix. These are issues that have been with us for a while and I would hope that more funds should be available to continue and address these issues. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Abraham. And that concludes our budget hearing. I want to thank everyone for coming out today. Um, I want to thank the, the citizens that are here. You took time off your day to do that. For those of you from Choya, thank you for coming all out. Uh, I want to thank the city manager and his staff for coming out as well. Uh, it's important that they get to hear. So you've got multiple levels of staff here. So it's not just one person that's hearing this. Now you've pretty much got the entire city of Phoenix listening to some of the concerns that we have with the budget. And again, uh, we've gone through this before where this is a trial budget. We put it out there so that people can see what we have and then make adjustments to that. And every year, I can't remember the last time we haven't, we've seen some significant changes to the budget because of uh, the comments that we received at the hearings. So thank you all for coming out today. Really appreciate it. And uh, you know, we've got other budget hearings. If you think you forgot something, you know, you're free to go to the other budget hearings as well because we have other people from all over coming to each of these budget hearings. Thank you for coming out today.